Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our Thursday afternoon webinar. I'm Melinda Bikini, Director of Patient Services with the Cholangiocarcinoma Foundation. I'm also a 13-year survivor of stage four intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. And we are so excited today to be joined by Dr. Bruno Odisio from MD Anderson. Um, Dr. Odisio is Associate Professor of Interventional Radiology and Co-Director of Research Department of Interventional interventional radiology at MD Anderson. We invite you to put questions in the Q&A or the chat box. And as always, after the presentation, we'll take some time to answer those questions. Um, and again, just a reminder that we would appreciate if you could keep your questions general in nature and not specific to your diagnosis, as Dr. Odisio will not be able to, um, you know, give you medical uh, advice through the webinar, but he would be happy to answer questions to the best of his ability. I will turn it over to you, Dr. Odisio. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so much, Melinda. Uh, good afternoon to the cholangiocarcinoma uh, community. Uh, it's a great honor to be here today. I've been having the privilege to work with many patients uh, during their journey uh, with cholangiocarcinoma along the years, and I, I have a, a big admiration and uh, gratitude to be working with this you know, a patient community. It's a tight, very well uh, uh, knowledgeable community that has really helped us uh, uh, to move this field along and uh, to achieve some of the data, some of the research, uh, and some of the conclusions that I'm going to try to share with you all today. So the, the title of my presentation today is Can Interventional Radiology Therapies Help Patients with Intrapatic Cholangiocarcinoma? I think it's a uh, 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 I think the answer we all know that is yes, uh, but I just wanted to explain why and how we feel that we can contribute to the multidisciplinary management uh, of patients with intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. I'm gonna uh, uh, focus on intrahepatic because I think most of the data uh, that we have in terms of the interventional radiology procedures are based on intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. I'm not also going to talk much uh, uh, about surgical data, uh, neither uh, radiation therapy data. Those are local therapies options that are very well applied and they have a, a, a great application for several patients, but I'll try to focus on my uh, field of expertise uh, per se. So why we feel that if we do a local therapy to the liver, why we think that's going to help patients with intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. So we believe, based on retrospective data and some prospective data, that when you control the tumor burden on the liver, you improve the overall survival and quality of life of those patients, mainly because you are preventing or delaying uh, complications related to the tumor growth uh, on the liver, such as oral vein, uh, vascular invasion or biliary obstruction and its consequences, such as sepsis due to biliary obstruction, cholangitis, or liver insufficiency due to a large tumor or uh, vascular occlusion. So on the right side of this slide, we can see uh, Kaplan-Meier curve from a paper that was published by uh, our group here at MD Anderson in 2018, making a comparison of patients who receive resection, here illustrated in brown, who had radiation therapy, chemotherapy, or best supportive care. This is for biliary tract cancers. And we can see that the patients who received resection, they did better than patients who received radiation therapy, who did better, who had not only systemic chemotherapy, who also did better than the patients who just received best supportive care. So that's one of the many illustrations that if we do a local therapy, uh, in selected patients, we might uh, bend the curve of survival and outcomes of that patient. The big uh, uh, point that I want to make here, and that's the first conclusion that will come up uh, on this presentation, is that this data needs to be analyzed uh, and understood on, in terms of the there is a selection bias, right? If you take patients who go to surgery, Usually those patients, they're healthier and they have a more limited disease and patients will receive best supportive care. So it's not a, a very clean data in terms of a statistical analysis. You have selection bias, selection criteria that are applied for each of those uh, uh, treatments. And 
by consequence, uh, you know, the results, they need to be tempered, you know, and they, they need to be analyzed with some uh, 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 grain of salt, so to speak. And how we, you know, as interventional radiologists, uh, how we, we can help patients with cholangiogram carcinoma. So the first thing is, what is an interventional radiology specialty? So it's a medical specialty uh, that performs minimum invasive procedures using medical imaging guidance. So we use CT scans, uh, 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 fluoroscopy machine, MRI, ultrasound to help us uh, to treat patients with diverse types of cancer. Interventional oncology, which is uh, the cornerstone of what we do here at MD and Anderson is a branch of interventional radiology that is dedicated to the care of patients with cancer. And we help those patients by doing diagnosis of their cancer, treatment, and palliation of the complications associated with their cancer. So what I'll try to focus here is not much on the diagnosis or the palliation, but rather on the treatment. So what kind of treatments we offer on the interventional radiology that we can uh, apply for patients with cholangiocarcinoma? And uh, uh, this is a slide that I always try to show uh, when we talk about cholangiocarcinoma. It's a Japanese survey uh, comparing types of local treatments uh, between different types of primary liver cancer. So a paracellular carcinoma on the left side and intraparic cholangiocarcinoma on the right side. And uh, as you can see here, uh, patients with HCC they receive ablation and chemoembolization, which are two forms of uh, local therapies uh, delivered by interventional radiologists in about a little over 60% uh, of the patients with paracellular carcinoma. Uh, on intraperiopolar carcinoma, only 5% of those patients on this Japanese survey received some sort of a local regional therapy. So uh, the conclusions that we can make from this slide is, number one, HCC is not intraperiopolar carcinoma, right? They are completely different diseases, but uh, 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 they, maybe the stage of the patients at the time that they get diagnosed of the intraperiopolar carcinoma make them not really eligible for ablation chemoembolization procedures. The other thing that we are not seeing on this slide, and it has to do with the fact that the local therapies that patients receive, they have a lot to do with the, the geographical location where those patients live, and the access to healthcare uh, 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 that those patients have. For instance, in Japan, it's very difficult to do radioembolization, which is a local regional therapy that we apply routinely in our patients here at MD Anderson with cholangiogram carcinoma. We don't see anything on this slide about radioembolization. And it's external beam radiation therapy that also has its role in the management of those patients is not being represented here. So if we want to do I slide with our own experience here in MD Anderson, that would be uh, quite different from the Japanese uh, experience. And it has to do with the local expertise and access to healthcare in general. So another point that I would like to make is interventional radiology, we do minimally invasive therapies that aim to uh, control the tumors uh, to the best of our extent, but as important as controlling the tumor is also to preserve the liver function and the quality of life of the patient. So it's always a balance. We try to be effective in terms of local tumor control, but we also uh, want to preserve the liver function and quality of life of those patients, because we know that there is a good chance that once we treat, let's say, one tumor uh, on the liver, there is a chance that that patient might develop another tumor in another side of the liver. And in order to provide a salvage therapy for that patient, we need to have sufficient functional liver volume so we can treat them again while we still maintain the liver function uh, within normal limits. So in terms of uh, the local therapies that we use for intraperiopolar carcinoma in interventional radiology, we essentially have two types of local therapies. We do percutaneous ablation, where we deliver a thermal energy uh, uh, to the tumor via a probe, an applicator, or we do what we call transarterial therapies. And those transarterial therapies can be subdivided into the delivery of radiation therapy through the hepatic artery. It's called radioembolization. Uh, commercially available in the United States, we have radioembolization with yttrium 90 or we do transarterial chemoembolization, which is, has been historically the most utilized uh, transarterial therapy uh, in the world for the treatment of different 
types of uh, liver cancer, but especially hepatocellular cellular carcinoma. So uh, different from surgery or radiation therapy, uh, we have in our armamentarium different types of local therapies. And with that comes our responsibility in deciding which is the best local therapy for a particular patient. And uh, that it's a, uh, first of all, a multidisciplinary discussion between the oncologist, the radiation therapist, the surgeon and the interventional radiologist, but also it's a evaluation of each patient on a personalized manner. So one of the elements that we uh, uh, try to analyze uh, obviously is the functional status of the patient, the overall clinical condition, what kind of systemic therapy the patient is receiving or not, and the overall performance status of those patients. But also as importantly for us is we need to get a better understanding of the extent of the disease uh, that the patient has on the liver because the extent of disease, the distribution, the size, the location, it help us to sort of like decide which local therapy we're gonna uh, offer for those patients. So uh, if we start with patients who have a very uh, uh, localized disease with small size, limited number of tumors. So typically patients who have uh, up to five tumors measuring up to three centimeters or a solitary tumor measuring up to five centimeters, we typically apply percutaneous ablation. So percutaneous ablation, the way we do this procedure is we do that under general anesthesia. Uh, we do a CT scan uh, and with the CT scan images, we uh, place a probe an applicator percutaneously through a small incision into the tumor and that probe, uh, at least here illustrated, this is a microwave probe, uh, that probe on the tip of it generates heat and the heat destroys the tumor and as importantly to, as destroying the tumor, it also creates a safety margin around the tumor by destroying some of the normal liver around that. That's what we call ablative margin. And we know that the better the margins we get, the the higher the local tumor control rate we're going to get. So from the uh, historical perspective, and if we take a histological analysis on the tumors that have been ablated on a liver explant, uh, by the histological analysis, this is a curative intent treatment, which means that once we do an ablation on a tumor, we don't want to leave any tumor cells behind. We want that tumor to be completely eradicated locally and hopefully that, that tumor will never come back. We'll never have what we call local tumor progression. So uh, if we could choose between the different local regional therapies we have in interventional radiology, ablation tends to be the first uh, one, the priority because of this curative intent uh, uh, goal. And when we take a look on the literature, there's a number of papers, but I think there are common threads on those papers. Uh, the first one is the number of patients. Most of those papers, they show a limited number of patients because unfortunately many patients with intrapatic collagen carcinoma, when they come to get a diagnosis, given the silent nature of this disease, they have an advanced disease that it doesn't make them uh, uh, eligible for ablation. Uh, but most of those patients, they have small tumors that we can see here. Most of the series, they show patients with tumors measuring, you know, around two to three centimeters. And uh, major complication rates are very low, uh, very uh, uh, limited with this technology, which is also an indication that those patients, they have a, a small disease tumor burden. And that's because of that, most likely, they have less complications. Uh, and also because a good number of those patients, they had liver resection for their cholangial carcinoma before developing a new tumor that was treated with ablation. So when you take a deep dive on this literature, what you're gonna see is that about 50 to 60% of the patients uh, presented here, they were patients who had an initial diagnosis of cholangial carcinoma. They had surgical resection and on the follow-up, on the surveillance after the, 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 the resection, they were detected with a smaller tumor. And since that tumor was small, they were eligible to have ablation and they came to ablation and they had a successful procedure. So uh, the ablation literature or intrapatic carcinoma is usually 
comprised by patients who had a prior liver resection. And uh, uh, that explains a lot the tumor size and the complications associated uh, uh, with those patients. Uh, this is our series. Uh, it hasn't been updated in the last two years, but it's a series that we put together between MD Anderson and the University of Turin in Italy, in the northern uh, part of Italy, where they have a good number uh, of referrals of patients with intrapericolangio carcinoma. And we analyzed 46 patients with 69 tumors with a mean tumor size of 1.6 centimeters, ranging from you know, sub-centimeter tumor to up to 5.1. And the primary efficacy, which means the ability of, of doing an ablation, don't have any tumor uh, uh, residual after the ablation was 89%. So on the right side, we have different curves. Uh, medium overall survival in that patient population was about a little over three years. Uh, local tumor progression for survival, we did not reach the median uh, local tumor progression survival. This means local recurrence of the tumors that we ablated. Uh, but as you can see, the intrahepatic progression free survival here represented in green uh, was around you know, a little less than one year, which means that those patients, they develop new tumors on their liver uh, after we eradicate the ones that we did ablation. And that also highlights the need to do local therapies that are effective to the tumors we're treating but they also minimize the amount of damage to the normal liver because it's most likely that those patients might develop a new tumor and they need to have functional liver left to sustain another local regional therapy in the future. So ablation would be for patients with limited uh, tumor burden on their liver where we're applying a local therapy that at least in our desire, it should match with surgery, it should be curative intent, it should not leave any tumor behind. If we move to the second uh, stage in terms of disease extension, would be patients with larger tumors or patients with bilateral liver involvement, where we feel that the ablation from the technical standpoint would not be uh, effective. And uh, ablation at this point on clinical practice should not be applied as a palliative treatment should be always applied with the goal of completely eradicating every single tumor the patient has on the liver. So on circumstances where we cannot apply ablation, one therapy that we feel uh, it's very useful is radioembolization. And radioembolization, chemoembolization, they are all transarterial therapies. And the rationale behind uh, to, that, to perform such therapies it's due to the very unique characteristics of the blood perfusion to the liver. The liver is one of the few organs on the body that has a dual blood supply. So uh, a liver, about 90% of the blood comes from the portal vein, which it's a vein that recruits all the blood vessels that comes from the intestines, and you get all the, you know, all the, all the uh, food that you, you know, being uh, digesting and getting absorbed in your body, you know, all the elements, the proteins, and the minerals and everything goes through the portal vein to your liver and your liver metabolize. Uh, and 10% of the liver blood supply comes from the hepatic artery. Interestingly, when you have a primary liver cancer, uh, such as a parocellular carcinoma, but that's also true to many of the intrahepatic cholangio carcinomas, that proportion inverts. Most of the blood supply to a tumor comes from the hepatic artery, not from the portal vein. And that's the rationale why we decide to put a catheter on the hepatic artery instead of the portal vein to deliver something from the hepatic artery that will reach preferentially the tumor and do a local therapeutic oncological effect through the hepatic artery into the tumor. So if we uh, use, for instance, radioembolization, uh, which is our preference in our institution instead of chemoembolization, uh, the, uh, the, the amount of therapeutic effect we're going to get to the tumors is proportional to the amount of arterial supply the tumor has, but also proportional to the dose of radiation you're delivering to that tumor. And the distribution of the spheres, because the radiation is delivered by those tiny spheres that have about 30 microns in size, and uh, they need to be distributed within the tumor in sort of like a very homogeneous way, as it's being illustrated here. So in terms of uh, uh, data, 
with greater mobilization with Vitrium 90, uh, what we're going to see differently from uh, uh, the ablation literature is that most of those patients, they have uh, uh, multiple lesions. Uh, they have also uh, uh, a shorter follow-up period because they are presenting to that treatment on a uh, more advanced stage of their disease. And uh, also, I believe because of that, uh, uh, the survival rates, they are not as great as the ablation, but that doesn't mean that the Y9 is not an effective therapy. It just means that we're you know, encountering and offering that therapy on the late stages of disease. Uh, and also the complications, you know, the complications, they tend to be a little bit more frequent with that therapy. Uh, but uh, Y90 for intrapatic colonial carcinoma or in general, it's one of those uh, treatments that have really changed in the last five to six years because we have come to learn a great deal about the dosimetry of Y90. So now compared to five or six years ago, uh, we know what is the threshold to do an effective Y90 treatment to the tumor, but also we know the threshold on how to do that in a way that we're preserving the normal liver uh, to the best extent that we can. And uh, that also help us to better select patients who would be uh, good candidates for Y90. So if we take a look on this uh, slide I'm showing you right now, it's a slide with uh, old uh, data uh, where the advanced dosimetry methodology has not been applied. And I believe that if we replicate uh, those studies with advanced dosimetry, the results will be significantly better. Uh, and that's what we're seeing in the patients that we're you know, treating here at MD Anderson. Uh, we're very fortunate to have uh, a group of physicians who have really do, done um, uh, groundbreaking work on, on radiation dosimetry for Y90, uh, Chinu Kapadaf and uh, Dr. Mima Bash. Uh, uh, Chinu Kapadaf is a, uh, is a nuclear medicine uh, physicist and uh, uh, Dr. Mavash is an intervention radiologist that I have the pleasure to work with. And uh, I think uh, we are gonna see better results on the cholangio carcinoma patients submitted to Y90 because of the advances in the way that we are doing advanced dosimetry for those patients. This is a study that I believe many of you have been uh, uh, learning about. It was a phase two trial done in France by Edelin and colleagues that was published in 2019, where they analyzed first line systemic therapy combined with radioembolization as a first line therapy. So 41 patients, seven centers, and they combined GEMSYS with Y90, uh, and they show a median progression of survival of about 14 months, a median overall survival of 22 months, and 22% of the patients, uh, nine patients, they were downstage uh, to be eligible for resection. Uh, in terms of radiological response, we use different uh, uh, methods for analyzing response. The most uh, widely utilized is called a RESIST criteria. The RESIST criteria is a criteria that uses essentially the size of the tumor, not the the perfusion, the vascularization of the tumor. That particular study, the best response by RECIS was 41%, but if we use an enhancement criteria, which tends to be much more accurate and to correlate better with survival, like uh, the CHOI criteria, uh, the response rate on this particular study was about 93%. So uh, disease control was ob uh, observing 98% of the patients. So disease control means uh, complete response a partial response or so stable disease. So uh, it seems that we can do Y90 as first line uh, therapy combined with systemic. Uh, and that could potentially, uh, at least this study shows a signal that we can do that with the aim of trying to downstage uh, patients to resection, which is uh, the curative intent treatment of uh, election, you know, gold standard for us at this present moment. The third situation is patients who have a large widespread distribution of the tumor. And typically here, we're talking about patients who have over 50 to 75% of the total liver uh, replaced by tumor. And this is a situation where we 
we need to know where we can help and where we cannot help. And here, uh, it's not a situation where interventional radiology uh, most of the times can help much those patients with therapy, such as guanidine ablation, chemoembolization. Uh, this is a patient population that probably in our center will be managed with some systemic therapy, see how the patients will respond to systemic therapy, and after assessing the response, depending on the type of response, we could uh, uh, evaluate those patients for some transarterial therapy to uh, see if we can reduce the tumor size a little bit more and reduce the chance of having vascular and biliary complications. Uh, those patients also, they are uh, seen by us on the interventional radiology to help them with the management of a biliary obstruction or a portal vein obstruction. For instance, they put a portal vein stance to open up the blood flow to the liver, or we can do uh, local therapies to bridge those patients to liver resection. For instance, we can do portal vein embolization or biliary decompression with the aim uh, not to treat the tumor necessarily, but to promote liver growth and keep liver function in a way that those patients can receive surgery or even systemic therapy if they are too sick to receive systemic therapy due to the uh, liver extension of their tumor. Uh, another point that I would like to make is that when we discuss about different treatments for patients with different types of cancer, and that's not only a reality for uh, patients with cholangiocarcinoma, but with any type of liver cancer, we really need to think as uh, the patient's journey during their cancer treatment. So uh, it's a longitudinal journey. It's a, it's a marathon. There will be multiple encounter, points of encounter with multiple care providers along their disease course. And we need to factor that ideally since the beginning of their journey with cancer, because the last thing we want is to burn bridges where we cannot offer further therapy as they go through their disease process. So uh, one thing that we have seen here is that doing the sequential local therapies, uh, it serves with two purposes. The first one is to rescue a patient at the time that they progress after, let's say, patient receive external beam radiation, had a really nice response, but developed a new tumor. And we rescue that patient with another therapy, such as an ablation. COVID-19. And sometimes, and that's like the minority of the patients, is when you uh, combine different local therapies according to the safety and efficacy profile of each of those local therapies. So for instance, if you have a very central tumor uh, on the liver and we feel it's not safe to ablate and the tumor is hypovascular and cannot be treated with Y90 because it requires arterial supply to the tumor, we can do external beam radiation to that central tumor, and we can treat a peripheral tumor with either ablation or Y9. So it's a combination of the best of the technical aspects, and the safety profile of each of these, those therapies. So here on the right side of this slide, this is a SUNK diagram where we analyze patients. It's not cholangiocarcinoma, it's a parocellular carcinoma. And we saw patients who had sort of like an advanced disease stage that were, they receive uh, radioembolization for their HCC or external beam radiation for their uh, HCC. And then we saw what kind of pathway those patients had during their disease journey. And as you can see, a good number of patients, once they develop a new tumor or they recur the, the tumors that were treated initially, they receive salvage therapies. And they keep receiving that for several times until they eventually, we feel it's not safe uh, to do other local therapy, then there are, you know, some of them uh, transition back to systemic therapy. And what we have noticed on this hepatocellular carcinoma patient population, again, different from cholangiocarcinoma, carcinoma, but is when you are able to rescue patients who had progression with further local therapies, again, the survival seems to be better. So here in green are patients who were initially treated, had a tumor recurrence, and we were able to rescue the patient with a further local therapy and their survival, it's uh, similar to patients who never recur on this retrospective data and is significantly better than the patients 
who had progression and we were not able to salvage them with further uh, local regional therapies. Again, the retrospective study, there is a selection bias. We need to be very cautious about how we interpret that data. But it seems it's another signal for us that if we can treat those patients sequentially uh, and rescue their liver disease tumors while we still maintain the liver function, they tend to do better than if we just don't treat their liver tumors. So I want to uh, show a case. Uh, I think many of you have seen this case before, but it's a, I think it's a nice illustration of a patient's uh, uh, journey uh, with cholangiocarcinoma and how sequential therapies were done. This patient is 37 year old. Uh, he was initially diagnosed with this central cholangiocarcinoma here. He had a biliary uh, stent placed by endoscopy, initiated gens uh, genesis, and had a liver resection, a right extended patectomy in 2017. And that tumor was completely removed, eradicated, and did fine. Uh, a couple, uh, I would say about eight months later, he unfortunately developed a very central recurrence on his liver remen that we uh, decided to treat with irre irreversible lateral operation, which is a uh, type of uh, ablation therapy that we do. And at that time, the patient was also listed on the liver transplant wait list. So the goal here was to control his disease, show disease stability for six months, so he could receive the liver transplant. And we did the IRE to that central lesion. And he did fine. He had complete response. The tumor disappeared. A few months later, he developed this very central tumor here. And albeit being a little bit small, uh, less than two centimeters in size was in a location that we could not do ablation because the bio ducts were very close to it. And when we do an ablation nearby the bio ducts, you can burn the bio ducts and have a pretty bad complication with biliary leakage and everything. So what we did is we transitioned from a percutaneous therapy to Y90. So this is a post Y90 administration. And again, he had complete response on that tumor. And uh, during the Y90 treatment, we also noticed a tiny, tiny tumor here that we went ahead and we just did ablation on it. We were able to control the disease of this patient for six months. He did not show any new tumors on his liver. He was eventually transplanted, and this is his liver uh, explant. There were no viable tumors on his liver. So it was a, a good indication for us that we were able to do local minimally invasive therapies that ultimately had a curative uh, function on this patient. And uh, uh, we're very happy with that, but also illustrates how we use the medical oncologist, the surgeon, the interventional radiologist, and how this multidisciplinary management is so important uh, to not burn any bridges and offer the best option possible for each of those patients. So if we take a look on everything that we have talked so far, uh, I think one, important slide I would like to share is, as a physician, what kind of questions I would like to have my patients asking me when they see me on the clinic to evaluate for a local therapy? And uh, I think the first one is why I think that local therapy, that particular one, ablation, uh, external beam radiation, Y90 or nothing is the right therapy for me. Uh, and why, let's say, if you look on the internet, on Facebook, and you saw that you know, that someone doing uh, that fancy, you know, innovative therapy somewhere, why you're not offering that to me? Why you think this is not adequate? I think that's a very valuable conversation uh, for the patients, but also for the physicians. You know, I, I, we learn a lot with those conversations, and I think it's uh, it's very helpful to have this questioning. Uh, in a two-way manner. And uh, I really appreciate when the patients do that. The other thing is, what are the risks uh, associated with this therapy? I think that it's common for any medical treatment, uh, but especially for patients with cholangiocarcinoma, I think one point that it should be always asked is, what are the long-term implications of this therapy? If I receive this treatment, does it mean that I cannot receive any other treatments on my, on, on my liver? Does it mean that my liver function will be altered? Does it mean that I'm not gonna be eligible for surgery? I think those are questions that usually will be answered on a multidisciplinary manner, but it's really important to check with each one of your 
uh, physicians uh, on how they feel about that. Uh, the third one is what are the overall goals of this therapy in terms of the local tumor control? Are we doing a therapy that is curative intent, such as ablation or a very high dose of Y90 to a very focal uh, location of the liver? Or are we doing this as a palliative treatment with the goal of controlling the disease since we cannot really be curative and on that disease? I think that's a, a really key question. The fourth one is what are the alternatives? If we don't do that, what should we do? And uh, the fifth one, and I think it's especially applied for this community here, you are all so well educated that you should ask what is the scientific data behind that? Because that's gonna be ultimately the patient's decision and we need to offer uh, the best evidence available for the patient so they can make their own decisions. Uh, radiation uh, therapy and interventional radiology, they are usually uh, referring providers, which means that typically most of our patients, I would say 100% of our patients, they, uh, they saw either a surgeon or oncologist before seeing us. But I think having that conversation, it's a great opportunity for us as physicians to explain what we do and what kind of options we have for, for those patients. So just to uh, getting close to the end here, uh, in terms of what we feel that would be important for us as a community of interventional radiologists to learn more about intrapericolangio carcinoma, uh, you all know that molecular profiling in biliary tract cancer, it's a very hot topic right now. And we're trying to understand how such different molecular signatures might affect or not the types of local therapies we do. I think this is more than a simple uh, intellectual exercise. I think based on that, we can uh, predict uh, patterns of progression of tumors. And based on that, we can allocate different local therapies uh, to, again, try to maximize local tumor control, but also uh, maintain uh, sufficient functional liver behind. So in conclusions, uh, I think that Patient selection is a key factor for opt optimal outcomes when we do interventional radiology uh, treatments for intrapericolangio carcinoma. I think we have a good number of procedures and options that we can offer for the patients, but those are not outcomers. We need to select patients. We need to be criterious about the way that we offer that to the patients. Uh, as of now, we have what we call this hierarchical approach for IR therapy. So if a patient can be ablated, he or she should be ablated. Uh, if ablation is not really possible, then we feel that Y9 should be the best second option here. And I'm not saying that Y9 is not curative intent. I think in selected patients, Y9 can be actually curative intent in the way that you uh, deliver the dose and you do the dosimetry for those patients. And if you cannot do Y90, then we would reserve chemoembolization as the last option as of now. And this is based on the data that we have in the literature. Uh, I think we need always, since the get-go, to provide safe and effective sequential therapeutic options. And we still need, as a community, uh, prospective trials. We need to have uh, prospective data validating all the signals that we have encountered on our retrospective analysis. And uh, I think we're just going to be able to do that with the help of this amazing community we have here. So I'm going to finish here. This is my uh, uh, email. I'm at your no disposal for anything. And it was a real pleasure to be here. I think we're going to open for questions, right? Yes, we are. We've got some questions that came in. Thank you. That was great. Um, the first question is, is local therapy defined as radi radiology only or a combination of therapies? It's a great question. I think local therapy it's any treatment that is delivered locally to the liver. So when you talk about local therapies, we should also include surgery, surgical resection, and also uh, radiation therapy. So uh, we don't own the, the term local therapy. Our colleagues from surgery and radiation therapy, they also deliver some sort of uh, local therapies. Uh, but then we have the IR local therapies, which are the ones that I, I mentioned today. Perfect. And um, just to the audience out there, feel free to put your questions in the Q&A box or the chat box so we can get to them. 
So for large widespread distribution, would you use proton or photon radiation? I think that's a great question for the radiation oncologists. I think there are some uh, pros and cons between protons and photons. Uh, uh, I think they have their applications. The other thing, as I mentioned, the very first few slides, uh, there is a, a matter of patient accessibility to a proton center. Not so many places in, in, in the world actually have uh, proton centers. But uh, uh, I think for what we've been doing for large central tumors, uh, it has been uh, our preference to uh, have our colleagues from radiation therapy to treat those patients. And they have shown really nice local tumor control rates with that approach. And uh, uh, the, the key here, again, is try to treat the tumor and minimize the exposure to the other normal liver around so we can treat those patients again uh, if needed. For a small, less than five centimeter tumor, millimeter tumor, is ablation still option if close to vena cava? If yes, what margins are necessary? I would say in principle, yes. Uh, less than five centimeters in size, uh, we, we uh, close to the vena cava, it would be possible to do an ablation. I think more important than the vena cava itself, it's what is the relationship of this tumor with the bioducts, because if you're close to the confluence of the bioducts or the portal vein, you might burn uh, that bioducts and then you're gonna have a, a complication. Uh, but uh, it's one of those cases that we have to see. Uh, 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 the images see what is the, uh, uh, in where the patient is on their cancer journey and uh, do a proper determination. That makes sense. What are the factors for ablation therapies you've spoken about versus external radiation, shaped beam or proton? Maybe you just hit on that, I don't know. I, I think, uh, uh, no, it's a really good question. I think what drives us to give ablation as a priority is the amount of data that we have surrounding ablation. Uh, that all being said, what we've seen is uh, proton radiation therapy has an application on those patients that we cannot do ablation safely. So if we cannot ablate safely because of the proximity of a, a, a large vessel or a bioduct, we refer those patients for radiation therapy. So I would say and there is a paper from our group that was published a few years ago that we tried to come up with a spatial localization of the tumor and try to match that with a, a local therapy. So for instance, if you have a tumor that is central and hypovascular, probably those patients will be better served with radiation therapy. Whereas if you have a, a tumor that is peripheral, uh, probably ablation uh, or Y90 if the tumor is hypervascular. Um, okay, do you think every cholangio patient should have a consult with an interventional radiologist or only if their oncologist recommends it? I think it's a really good question. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm very, very much biased to answer this question. My, 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 my answer would say yes, not necessarily because you... Uh, for instance, I am very privileged to work with a group of oncologists that you all know very well, uh, that you know they understand so much about interventional radiology that they could do the procedure with us uh, <laughs> in terms of patient selection and everything. But in other places, not necessarily. And I think in general, and that goes for healthcare in general, right? If you have a desire to see a provider, you should see that provider. Not not necessarily that that's going to change the, your management, but if it's going to give some ease of mind for you, I think you should see uh, that provider. I agree as a patient advocate. <laughs> My, um, okay, let's see. So with ablation, what do you expect for like side effects afterwards? Will there be bruising, swelling? So ablation, and I see the question here uh, on uh, ablation, what we see in over 80% of the patients, 80% uh, 
uh, is what we call post-ablation syndrome. It's a constellation of symptoms where patients have pain on their right upper quadrant. Many of those patients, they have pain on the right shoulder uh, because that's a referred pain from the liver. And they might have a fever, low-grade fever. They might have some nausea. Uh, and uh, they don't, they, it's almost like they have a cold, you know? And that might take up to two weeks after the procedure to get better. So what we do to our patient with ablation, first of all, is we disclose that so they have their expectations uh, in line. But we also give some medication, uh, not strong medication. Uh, we do some uh, anti-inflammatory, some anti nausea medication. Uh, sometimes we, we give a little bit of a stronger uh, pain meds so the patient can overcome this period of pain uh, after the procedure. So uh, it is expected to have pain. Uh, it should not be a lot of pain. If you're having too much pain, maybe you are not managing the pain in the proper way that should be managed. Uh, and the tricky thing with ablation in general is the, the pain, most of the pain happens after the day three to seven. So you have the ablation, you're like, oh, I'm great. I'm not having anything. That's awesome. And you go home and you don't get maybe this bunch of pills from your physician. Like, I'm not going to take that. And five days later, uh, the pain uh, starts. Uh, a bruising and swelling, uh, I would be a little bit more concerned with that if you're having a bruise and swelling because maybe that's an indication that they might have some bleeding. It can be a bleeding on the abdominal wall or an internal bleeding. Uh, so I, on that particular case that I'm seeing here, the patient had an electroporation, it might be a good idea to reach out to the physician who did the procedure to make sure that you're fine. Perfect. And then on the end of that, is there is it only one incision for the ablation, or do you go in in different spots? There are different ways. Uh, I would say that we have a single probe, which will be a single incision. We uh, we don't get uh, an ablation zone larger than I would say two to three centimeters. We like to get at least five millimeters of margin on a three-dimensional plane after we do an ablation. So if we count five millimeters, you know, on the two sides is one centimeter. And if you're getting a two to three centimeters ablation zone, it means that if you really are very precise with your ablation probe, you're gonna ablate one tumor measuring up to one centimeter with one probe. If you have a tumor that measures more than one centimeter, you might have to put more than one probe. And it's a, it's a small incision. It's like an IV access. Uh, there are no stitches, no glue, no drains or anything like that, but it will be like a very small incision that it tends to heal itself. All right. What are the differentiators of choosing local radiation versus ablation? Yeah, I think we went, we went through that about like this location, the size and the, uh, uh, the safety uh, profile of each of those and, and the data as well, right? The data uh, of one or another. So what about, um, I think he's uh, talking about the hepatic arterial pump. How does that work with radiation or can you have it and still have radiation? So that's a really good question. I'm afraid I'm not the best person to answer because we don't do the pump here on MD Anderson. Uh, our colleagues at Memorial Sloan Catherine, they do that. Uh, it's a pump. Uh, they put on the hepatic artery and they do the infusion. Uh, the data, it's a, uh, it's a very compelling data. Uh, there are some elements of management, those uh, pumps that uh, require some care, uh, but usually it's reserved for patients with more advanced disease, right? So it's not the same patients that we're doing ablation or even a radioembolization many, many times. What is the concern for increased portal hypertension or cirrhosis secondary to total liver Y90? Uh, it's a really, really great question. That's a, uh, it's a real concern. There are data showing that after you know, several months, you might develop uh, uh, liver insufficiency, portal hypertension if you receive whole liver Y90, especially if you don't do the advanced dosimetry that we do nowadays. Uh, Y90 has been used for almost 20 years now, uh, but I think with any incorporation of any new therapy or technology, you go through a process of learning about the safety 
then you go about the efficacy and then you try to find a, a balance. And that's why I think where we are with Y90 right now. I think uh, we should not see those complications, uh, but we try to reduce the chance of doing that by doing advanced dosimetry. And by that, I mean to try to be as selective as you can to treat the tumors and maintain the normal liver to a threshold of radiation where the chance of developing uh, uh, liver-induced disease and for hypertension, all the complications associated with that, which is it's a very concerning scenario, uh, should be mitigated. Uh, yeah, but it's, it's a, it's, it is a, a, a real concern, not only with, exer with uh, Y90, but with external mean radiation. Okay. Um, I don't know if you posted your email, but if you would like us to share it, we can do that at the Absolutely. end. Okay, perfect. Um, and then the next question, I think we have about maybe four or five more questions. The difference between SBRT and TACE. So SBRT, uh, it's a radiation therapy treatment where uh, they deliver this high radiation dose in a focal manner externally. So it's a non-invasive treatment. Uh, TACE is a therapy where we put a catheter on the artery and we deliver uh, the symbolic material that is eluded with a chemotherapy. It can be doxorubicin, irinotecan, cisplatin. And uh, what we're trying to achieve with TACE is ischemia of the tumor and the high dose of chemotherapy uh, would destroy the tumor. And, no one really knows how that really happens. You know, if it's a vesicant effect of the chemotherapy or if it's a chemotherapeutic effect. So uh, uh, they are quite different on the way they are delivered and on the mechanistic way that they act. Uh, for instance, external beam radiation needs to have oxygen on the tumor. Uh, so it can have the, the radiation treatment working uh, with the radicals and everything. Uh, Heme embolization, on the other hand, it tries to reduce the blood flow and cut down uh, the oxygen to the tumor by consequence. So it's a, it's a little bit different uh, how they work. Okay. Is there any work with biliary cancer combining local regional therapy and immune therapy? Good question. Uh, as of now, we don't have any data on that. Uh, that's a fascinating topic. And the entire IR community is trying to come up with a potential use because we can use ablation as a primer for immunotherapy. For instance, you can treat partially a tumor. And by the, that partial treatment, you're going to expose the antigens of that tumor to the immunotherapy and hopefully would have a, a abscopal effect with a mm -hmm. systemic consequences. But that's still on the works, uh, I would say. Okay, so I had this question too. Are you a possible candidate for any of these procedures if you have cancer in the peritoneal lining or any other areas? If, if it's metastasized outside of the liver, is there a situation where you could still have um, the liver-directed therapy to control the disease? I think the short answer is yes. I think he, uh, but we're coming from the rationale that most of the tumor burden and the prognosis of that patient will be driven by their liver disease. If you have peritoneal disease, and it's a, you know, not a, it's a small amount of peritoneal disease or like a lymph node or something, or a small lung mat, we still believe that it's going to be the liver will drive the prognosis. So I, I, the short answer is yes, but it should be tailored for each patient, uh, as we all know. Okay. And then other radiation therapy like to the bones or to mm -hmm. like you said the lymph nodes I, I mean that can be done separate sometimes I see patients having radiation on their bones just to ease pain yes we I, we can offer for instance uh, not, not radiation uh, uh, Y90 or chemo embolization but for for instance cryoablation which is a form of percutaneous ablation to nodes uh, uh, for uh, bone mats that are painful when you're trying to palliate that tumor, uh, pain associated with that tumor. Uh, we can also apply that for the oncological treatment to try to control the disease on that location. That all being said, uh, if you have pain 
and is not being properly managed with pain medication, then I think an ablation is a good indication. But just to treat a small node, it has to, you need to take a look on the global aspect of the patient. Is that the only side of disease for the patient? If that's it, I think it makes sense to go after it and, you know, uh, 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 treat that. Is that a node that is growing and might get close to the bile ducts and obstruct the tumor? Yeah, maybe it might make sense to do radiation therapy, but just treating a node or a bone just for the sake of treating it, I don't think we have data to support that, right? Because in medicine, everything we do, take an aspirin, is not inconsequential, right? So we need to always be driven by data. Okay. Do you have any information on uh, CyberKnife, TomoKnife? I haven't heard of that one. No, I don't. Uh, that's a radiation. Maybe that's a, 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 a good, you know, a presentation to have here about the radiation therapy. Uh, role. Uh, but yeah. Sounds good. We'll special. put it on our list for next, next webinar. Um, is there a standard protocol for prescribing like steroids, antibiotics, blood thinners uh, to mitigate side effects during the recovery period after Y90? Is it a national standard or per institution and per doctor? It's very much driven per institution. Uh, and for instance, we give steroids for our patients who will undergo chemobolization. And uh, we try to tailor uh, what kind of pain meds the patients will receive after the Y9. I think one key factor, and that's one of the points that we should always see the patients on the clinic, is what kind of pain medication the patients are taking before the procedure. Because if you have your threshold altered to start, maybe you need something stronger. But there is not a national standard at this point. We should. Okay. It's a good idea. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> One comment from a patient from Quebec said she had her liver, uh, five metastases on the liver, had, I think she said, Y90 in the liver and never came back. No, she had percutaneous ablation in the liver and it never came back. So it's good to hear. It's great news. That's great news. And uh, 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 I mean, it's an example that you know, those local therapies, they are minimally invasive, but they can be very effective uh, on the proper uh, patient selection. So congratulations uh, for yes. having that. That's a, a, a great thing. It fills my heart. Uh, yes, me too. This is a good question. So which radiation therapies would you need to withhold a systemic therapy for? We, well, uh, so I, I, let me see if I understand the question. What kind of, if your patient is taking a systemic therapy and let's say we bring that patient to Y90, uh, uh, should we stop the systemic therapy? Uh, I think the short answer on the cholangiocarcinoma space is no. Uh, we tend not to withhold the systemic therapies. One thing that we try to time is if the patient has a lot of side effects associated with the systemic treatment, we don't want to uh, put the systemic uh, no side effects of the local therapy on top of it. So we try to time that with their systemic treatment. Uh, Bevacizumab, it's a medication that we typically stop because of the risk of bleeding, but uh, the surgical literature, it's about one month uh, uh, to stop bevacizumab before surgery as being a little bit less invasive than surgery. We just stop one week before and after. But in general, we don't stop uh, all the other medications. Okay, I think this is the last question. What is your best imaging system from your experience, which your go-to when the lesions are very little and also for the follow-up exam? Uh, I, I think, think our patients have this question all the time. Do I get a CT, an MRI, a PET scan? What, you know, what, did, what is yeah. the right imaging? And that's uh, something very uh, palpable is, you know, this stress and this fear of the follow-up imaging, right? You, you don't yeah. want to see something, <laughs> but you want to make sure that whatever imaging you had actually is able to show you something. I, I would say that's really uh, institutionally driven. For instance, here on MD Anderson, uh, that's my personal opinion. Uh, I feel that uh, CT in general uh, gives us a better idea of what we did in terms of local regional therapy and the effects of it. Then for instance, MRI 
or PET CT because we really rely on the enhancement of the tumor to see uh, uh, the the effects. But if you are in a, another institution where MRI is the modality of choice, you should go with MRI. I would say that uh, from the practical standpoint, you're going to end up between MRI and CT, right? PET CT, you cannot be doing PET CT so frequently. Uh, and uh, there are pros and cons. Uh, in, in general, MRI has a better sensitivity to detect lesions than CT, but not everything that you detect minus be something real. So it's a balance, right? You want to know, but you don't want to be doing up imaging that will show you things that are not necessarily meaningful for your treatment. So I think it's a it's a it's a complex question to answer, and I yeah. think it's a question that it should be discussed at length with the uh, primary oncologist. But it's a really really good question. Yeah, and it doesn't matter which modality you use, the scan anxiety never goes away. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Um, last question from me, curious to know, are there any current uh, clinical trials that would be eligible, our patients would be eligible for that include um, Y90 or anything, taste, anything like that, that you know of? There are some uh, prospective studies. Uh, they are more on the registry side on how, you know, the ablation or the Y90 therapies are uh, being applied. Uh, there is some ongoing uh, work uh, by some of my colleagues uh, on trying to use Y90 in a prospective manner as a second line therapy with systemic therapy. Uh, and but similar to uh, what he, they have done on colorectal liver metastasis. So there is a, a ongoing efforts uh, for that, and uh, hopefully we can see that maturing on a trial in, in the next few years. Uh, also, we are trying to understand more about the tumor biology of those patients, so that's more on the exploratory side, but we want to, for instance, try to biopsy uh, as much patients as we can and create a tumor biobank where, you know, we can apply some analysis down the line to help us to understand more how we should allocate those patients. That, that's the scenario in, in, in general right now for uh, uh, IR clinical trials. There are a few studies also on uh, chemobilization. They are more on the European side, uh, but uh, uh, I think we have to do more I as a society. Change. Yeah. Yeah, and I encourage patients to join those trials so we can get the data we need to know. Um, thank you, Dr. Odysseo, very, very much for um, presenting for us today. We appreciate it. This will be recorded and available to watch on our website for all of you who uh, would like to watch again or to share it with others who didn't get a chance to be here today. We appreciate you so much, and there's a lot of thank yous coming in. Thanks so much, Melina. Thanks so Take much, care. everybody. I'm very glad to work with you all, and I have a, a, my deepest respect for you know, your contribution to this science. So thanks so much. Thank you. We appreciate it. You have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.